Aloha, everyone. I have a question for you today. Did you know work is a blessing? Did you know work is a gift from God? What am I talking about? Well, hi, I'm Brian Ashbell, pastor of Honolulu Assembly of God here in beautiful Honolulu, near world-famous Diamond Head. It's Wednesday, August 28th, and I'm excited, friends. I'm excited because we're looking at incredible scripture passages all this month of August and in the next month of September that have the potential to be life-changing. That's right, friends. That is right. If you apply these powerful truths, you like, they can change your life. And this powerful life-changing truth comes from Genesis chapter 2. First book of the Bible, second chapter, Genesis chapter 2. So did you know that work is a blessing? That's our question. Did you know that work is a gift from God? What in the world am I talking about? Well, this coming Monday, September 2nd, we were, we're going to celebrate Labor Day. It's an interesting holiday with an interesting history. And I was thinking about that today. I wanted to share with you a couple of resources. First one, Investopedia. Investopedia.com. Having the first Monday in September off from work was remarkable for American workers in 1894 when Labor Day was declared a national holiday. Working conditions in the country's factories, railroads, mills, and mines were grim. Employees, including children, were often required to work 12 or more hours a day, six days a week, in crowded, poorly ventilated spaces. Calls for shorter work days and better conditions came from workers' strikes and rallies, rallies in the decades after the Civil War. Union leaders in New York City organized what is thought to be the first Labor Day parade on September 5th, 1882. And there's a picture there, Vestopedia. It uh, looks pretty impressive. Tens of thousands of labor union members, including bricklayers and many other tradespeople, took unpaid leave and marched with their locals. The day culminated in picnics, speeches, fireworks, and dancing. And, you know, as time went by, several states adopted the holiday. And on June 28th, 1894, Congress packed, passed an act making the first Monday in September of each year a legal holiday. Wow, 130 years ago. Well, the Department of Labor website, I, I also went there because there was an inter interesting question. They asked McGuire versus McGuire who founded Labor Day. Who first proposed a holiday for workers, the question they asked. It's not entirely clear, but two workers can make a solid claim to the founder of Labor Day title. Some records show that in 1882, Peter J. McGuire, MC, capital G-U-I-R-E, General Secretary of the Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners and a co-founder of the American Federation of Labor, suggested setting aside a day for a, quote, general holiday for the laboring classes, unquote. But Peter McGuire's place in labor day history has not gone unchallenged. Many believe that machinist Matthew McGuire, not Peter McGuire, Matthew McGuire, M-A-G-U-I-R-E, not Peter McGuire, M-C, capital G-U-I-R-E, founded the holiday. Recent research seems to support the contention that Matthew McGuire of Patterson, New Jersey, proposed the holiday in 1882 while serving as secretary of the Central Labor Union in New York. According to the New Jersey Historical Society, after President Cleveland signed the law creating a national Labor Day, the Peterson Morning Call newspaper published an opinion piece stating that, quote, the souvenir pen should go to Alderman Matthew McGuire of this city, who is the undisputed author of Labor Day as a holiday, unquote. Both McGuire, according to Department of Labor, both McGuire and McGuire attended the country's first Labor Day parade in New York City that year. Wow, what a what an interesting history, friends. It's a uh, uh, a very interesting history. And, you know, you know, the value and necessity of labor are taught in Scripture. Uh, from, the, for example, the book of Proverbs warns many times about being a slugger, warns against being a lazy person. To all the way to Apostle Paul's instruction, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, that if a man shall not work, neither shall he eat. Well, let's go back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, and verse 15 and verse 19 through uh, 20. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And skipping to verse 19, it says that, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. 
So the man, meaning Adam, gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, all the beasts of the field. What a, what a project, what an assignment that day, friend. Adam had to name every beast, uh, you know, uh, that, that was granted. So there's value, there's necessity of work uh, right from the beginning, right from Genesis chapter 2. So let's consider the positive benefits of work. I would like to give you three plus one plus one. And uh, you'll understand that in just a moment. But the first three are this. Work, number one, work is the way of nature. Work is the way of nature. God created all the universe to be in motion. Work is all around his friends. Air, earth, water, they're always busy. There's life going, happening and working everywhere. Bees are making honey. Birds are building nests. Large animals are hunting their prey. Beasts of burdens are plodding along the beaten path. And you've heard the statement, busy as a bee, speaking of bees. Busy as a bee. Well, honey is nectar that bees have repeatedly regurgitated and dehydrated. They've regurgitated. Kind of makes you think twice about eating honey next time, maybe. Workers are sexually undeveloped females whose life expectancy is approximately 28 to 35 days, just around a month. And in the course of her lifetime, that month that she's alive, a worker bee will produce one twelfth, one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. A single hive, you know, might look like a lot of bees. Listen to this, friends. A single hive contains approximately 40 to 45,000 bees. That's a lot of bees. Bees collect 66 pounds of pollen per year per hive. And to make one pound of honey, workers in a hive, catch this, friend. They fly, workers in a hive, to, to make one pound of honey, fly 55,000 miles. 55,000 miles, they need to get a frequent flyer card. I'm sure they could qualify for a free tip. They fly 55,000 miles between those, 40, you know, all those bees. There's a hierarchy, so not of all of them are flying, but many of them are. They tap 2 million flowers. Theoretically, the energy in one ounce of honey would provide one bee with enough energy to fly around the world. So they're definitely busy as a bee. Friends, work is the way of nature. Number two, work is a safeguard of society. Work is a safeguard of society. You know, there's a great problem today. This attitude, society owes me a living. If society does not give it to me, if the world does not give it to me, then I'll take it myself because they owe me. It's this victim mentality, and it's totally unproductive, friends. And nothing is accomplished through it. <laughs> society, let me make this very clear. Friends, society owes you nothing. It owes you nothing. The world doesn't owe you a thing. This is key. Parents, teach your children the value of work. Teach your children the value, the necessity of making a difference in the world. It's been said the idle mind is the devil's playground. And that's not from the Bible, but it, there's a lot of truth to it. You know, when we're lazy, that's why the Bible warns us about being lazy. Uh, you know, we become unproductive and our mind takes place when we shouldn't be going. So it's important to have work. It's important to have initiative. And that's how we accomplish hopes and dreams that the Lord puts in our heart. So, you know, it's a safeguard of society. Work is a safeguard of society. Number three, work is a cooperation with God. Work is a cooperation with God. You know, this is really important, friends. God gave us work so we might enjoy what he enjoys. You know, we can enjoy what he enjoys. God enjoyed creation, and that's why he had Adam be his partner. He, and, he recruited Adam to be in, in work with him. God works. Therefore, we work. Jesus talks about his work, for example, in John chapter 9, verse 1 through 4. As he went along, he, meaning Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 3 and 4. And here it is. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. So work, work is very important, friend. Uh, it's, I, have a, I have a book in my library entitled Special Occasion Sermons, and I've never read these, I uh, never shared these sermons, never preached these sermons. Uh, they're uh, quite old. For example, this was one is entitled The Dignity of Labor. From James Burrell, Doctor of Divinity, from, uh, who lived in 1844 to 1926. So this message is probably 100 years old or more. Uh, based on Genesis 2.15, that scripture I shared a few moments ago, 
The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to dress and keep it. And he writes this, God never made a loaf of bread. He made a man in a field, and to the man he said, Behold, I have made a field, you must do the rest. If the man refuses to till the soil, reap the harvest, grind the corn, and bake the flour, he shall not eat bread. God never made a coat. He made a man and a sheep, and to the man he said, Lo, I have made a sheep and wool to grow upon its back, you must do the rest. If the man will not shear the fleece and card the wool and spin and weave it, his back will go bare. God never made a house. He made a man in a forest. And to the man, he said, go into the forest, fell a tree and make for yourself a house or you shall have no roof to shelter you. The man who will not work is out of harmony with nature. So, you know, God provides the materials, provides the ability, gives us a, a good mind and, and skills and we work. And it's a wonderful partnership with him. So as I mentioned, there's three plus one and plus one, but let's look at that first one, and, and I'll, I'd like to give it three side benefits work very quickly. Now, first one is discipline. Discipline, the lack of discipline, friends, is, is key to a lot of trouble today, as I mentioned before. Vince Lombardi, the great, famous Green Bay Packer coach, considered by many to be among the greatest coaches and leaders in American sport, uh, the Super Bowl trophy is named after him, it's the Vince Lombardi trophy, said this, famously said this, and I quote, the dictionary is the only place that success comes before work. <laughs> the hard work is the prize we must pay for success. I think you can accomplish anything if you're willing to pay the price, unquote. That's a great quote from Vince Lombardi about discipline, and he also touches on the second one, accomplishment. Number two is accomplishment. You can see what you produce. It's wonderful to be able to see it, to, to hold it in your hand. If you don't produce something, it's discouraging. I'll never forget the first church I pastor on the east side of Seattle. There was a, a guy there who worked for a very large uh, construction company, built a huge, beautiful home. He was a finished carpenter with them, and he would uh, come uh, every once in a while, volunteers work and work around the building. He'd be hammering and sawing, and I remember vividly remember talking to him one day. I called him by name, Bob. I said, man, I envy you. I said, I envy you. You can see what you're doing. You can see what you're accomplishing. You know, I mean, I work hard during the week as a pastor. Uh, I, all these things I need to accomplish every week. And I, I do accomplish them. But my main calling is to make a difference in the lives of people. And I can't see that. I can't often see that happening. Once in a while I get clips, but I don't see that. You know, I told Bob after he's through hammering, after he's through sawing, after he's through doing whatever he's doing. You know, he can walk away and know that he's, he's accomplished something, he's, he's finished something. There's a sense of accomplishment. And that's number two. And that leads to number three, self-value. See, di discipline plus accomplishment equals value. There's joy. There's blessing. Going back to Dr. James Burrell's message one more time, he declares that labor is the secret of happiness. This, I love this picturesque language. The song of the toiler is the melody that has gladdened the earth. Who are the people that complain of the blues and the doldrums, of jaundice and melancholia? Who are the woebegone and disconnected, the grievers and complainers, les miserables? You will not find them in busy shops and counting rooms, but among those who have nothing to do. The happy people are those who go whistling to their task. They have no leisure for fret and worry, and their fare, you know, their food is too simple to induce dyspepsia. You know, that's an older word that refers to indigestion, probably ulcer. Dr. Burrell says it is a true saying, quote, the heart of the toiler has throbbings that stir, stir not the bosom of kings, unquote. Well, that's a great, great statement. So, as I mentioned, three plus one, that was these uh, three side benefits. And one more, one more, and that's action steps. Let me give five quick action steps about work about being a Christian at your job. They're short, so very quick. I'm going to go through them very quick. Number one, accept your job as a divine assignment. Accept your job as a divine assignment. You might think, well, I have a difficult job. I'm not sure I can do that. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verse 16, talk about work. There's lots going on around, around here. Philippians 1, 16, Paul declared, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Where's here? Where was he? He's in prison. And the Greek word is a military term, military term that emphasized Paul viewed even his prison experience as a divine assignment. So if Paul can see his time in prison, being put there in prison for the gospel, as a divine assignment, friends, wherever you are, 
that can be your just find and sign. The Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, with, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. It can be an expression of praise. Let it be a divine assignment. Number two, tap into the power of prayer. When you're at work and you're seeing challenging things and challenging people, tap into the power of prayer. Friends, we must believe in the power of prayer. We must practice it. We must believe it and practice it. We must realize that when we cannot persuade people or change the situation with our words, we can pray. And Jesus promised us that prayer can move a mountain. So tap into the power of prayer. Number three, use conversation as an opportunity to share the gospel. You know, when you're... When you're at work, use conversation. Be a good listener. If you're interested in others, will eventually draw them out. Encourage that coworker to open up, share their needs, and pray about their needs. That's a good way that you can share the good news. You can say, hey, Jesus can make a difference in your life. You made a difference in mine. I'd like to pray with you about this and uh, encourage you with that. So that's really important. Use conversation, opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Number four, apply the power of love. Apply the power of love. Friends, be convinced there is nothing as powerful as love. People respond positively to acceptance, to encouragement, to kindness, show love, give love, be a loving person. And number five, live a consistent Christian life. Live a consistent Christian life. Paul declared, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul was a good example because he followed the example of Christ. You and I, we need to do the same thing. Friends, don't be a bad example. Don't be a bad example. Instead, be a good example. Be a great example. Be a great model of a dynamic, growing, faith, fruitful Christian. Faithful, fruitful Christian. Build others up. Live a consistent Christian life. Friends, isn't that beautiful? That is powerful. That can change your life. Did you know work is a blessing? Did you know work? your work is a gift from God? God values your work, and you should too. There's a song we sing. Every once in a while, when we gather together at church, and it's in my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. Simple. Just repeat those words. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. And the second verse goes on. In my work, Lord, be glorified. In my work, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my work, Lord, be glorified today. And that's a prayer, friends. That is a beautiful prayer. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that can change your life. My question for you today is, Jesus Christ in charge of your life. Is he your Savior and Lord? Is he your Redeemer? Have you surrendered your life completely to him, friends? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Repent of your sin. Declare Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord. Put all your trust in him. That's the place to begin. Do it today. Do it today, friends. Don't wait till tomorrow or next week or next month. Do it today and partner with the Lord in work. Maybe you've done that. Maybe in response to what I've shared with you today, please leave me a comment. I really want to hear from you. Friends, please let me know how you're doing, wherever you are. Wherever you're watching, please leave me a message. Maybe it's our website, honoluluag.org. Honoluluag.org, where the invitation is come as you are. Everyone is welcome because no one is perfect, but through Jesus Christ, anything is possible. goes on to say we're a group of imperfect people who gather every week to worship a perfect God. We'd love to have you join us, friends. If you're imperfect, you're qualified. Or maybe it's our Facebook page. There were quite a few that was that were checking out, uh, who were checking out this Bible study last week. Uh, and if that's you, mahalo nui loa. Thank you very much. If you haven't been there, just go to Facebook and search Honolulu AG. Or maybe you're not on social media, and that's okay. Our YouTube channel will be a lot more convenient for you. Just go to YouTube, search for Honolulu Assembly of God. And when you get there, would you give us a like or subscribe, whichever is, is appropriate. And please, please, friends, share our website or Facebook or YouTube resource with others so they can be encouraged also. If you've been blessed today, if you've learned something, you know, <laughs> if nothing else, the history of uh, Labor Day uh, holiday, uh, share that with someone. Pass along to someone else and uh, find out, share with that person the value of work that God gives give the gift of work and that their job can be their divine assignment. Amen. We're going to pray in just a moment. Let me share one more thing that I'm excited about, as I am every week, and that, of course, is this Sunday, September 1st, we're going to consider God's gift of work, God's gift of work as we study the example of Daniel in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel was, was a great employee, and but he put the Lord first. Please invite, please invite someone, please, Invite someone to join you this Sunday morning at 10.35 a.m. 
either in the building, in the Kaimuki area of Honolulu, near world-famous Diamond Head, as I mentioned, just east of world-famous Waikiki Beach. Or if you can't join us in person, please join us online for our live broadcasts on either Facebook or our YouTube channel. We live stream every Sunday morning at 10.35 a.m. to both locations. We would love to have you join us in person or online. By the way, if you can join us in person after this Sunday morning's service, Labor Labor Day Sunday, everyone in the building is invited to stay for a, a Labor Day potluck lunch in the church's fellowship hall. Bring your favorite picnic foods to add to the table. It's going to be onolucious, as we say here in Hawaii. We love to have you join us. Are you ready to go to the Lord in prayer, friends? Let's do it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving me the gift of work. Please help me to show initiative and be diligent in the work and give it as a gift to you. Not be lazy, not be the sluggard, Lord, and not be careless about it, but help me to offer it to you as an expression of worship. Help me to recognize it as a divine assignment, the work that you give me. Lord, whether it's a task or whether it's a, a job at a, with a company, Lord, I, I, we offer, I offer it to you. And I pray that not only for myself, but I pray that for every person, Lord, that we would honor you with everything we say and do. And that we would surrender everything we have to you, Lord. Every, pray that for every person, every man, every woman, every young person. Every boy, every girl, may they look to you and be saved, Lord. May they repent of their sins and declare you as their Savior, Lord. Their life be transformed. Their perspective and attitude about their job be transformed. And they have joy in it instead of being a drudgery. Lord, I thank, thank you for how you can transform things and redeem those things. And we, we, we give our work to you, Lord. Our tasks, our responsibilities, our jobs, Lord, and we lay it at your feet for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, friends, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Aloha and aloha kikua. God loves you. God is love. Well, there's more life-changing truth coming up right here, right where you're watching. So I look forward to being with you again next time. Until then, God bless. Aloha. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.